Welcome everybody. This is Jim Morentz of the Exchange Core community and we've got a really cool presentation today. Last week the Cascadia Rising exercise took place and a number of different angles where Exchange Core was involved. We're going to hear about Sabre from Mary Marsh in uh, Idaho. We're going to hear from the California that did a parallel exercise. California wasn't uh, part of the formal national exercise, but did a parallel technology interoperability uh, exercise. First of all, I'll tell you a little bit about the exercise very briefly, and then about Sabre, which we've had some pre presentations on that in the past, so that'll just be one quick slide. And then Mary Marsh, who's with the Idaho Department of Homeland Security, will talk about how she used uh, Sabre. And it was, uh, we've been talking to Mary for a month or so and the exercise came up and within a very short period of time she was up and running and uh, will share with us her experiences there. Then we'll turn to the California Earthquake Clearinghouse Technology Interoperability Project where Ann Rosinski uh, will give you a minute or two on the uh, background of it and then turn right into these different applications. I think she's got uh, Google Earth and ArcGIS Online, Spot on Response, uh, and then we'll bring in Maggie Glasgow from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory to talk about and see some of the live uh, explanation of the results of the modeling that they did using their E-Decider e -Decider program that uh, delivered a number of different capabilities that were then shared out through Exchange Core to a wide variety of people. So. With that as introduction, uh, let me go ahead and show you where the Cascadia subduction zone is. That blue area comes right out of the U.S. Geological Survey, which provided that information through Exchange Core for it to be able to be captured there. Uh, the yellow and bluish area uh, is the uh, shaking area out of the USGS shake map. And this is a big, big deal earthquake. Uh, five minutes of motion, major ground effects. Uh, the real shaking areas are in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, all of which participated in a graded, graded FEMA exercise. As I mentioned, the California Earthquake Clearinghouse focused on technology interoperability since the state was not formally operating in it. But that's where Exchange Core came to play. Sabre, just to introduce Mary. Uh, those of you who have seen this before, Single Automated Business Exchange for Reporting. Where Exchange Core plays into it is that on the private sector operations centers, uh, there are a number of different ways that information can get into Exchange Core through Saber. Uh, they can take a simple spreadsheet and upload it through the Saber website. They can make a direct connection in this exercise. We had Walmart uh, was uh, created a direct connection to be able to, and that connection is operating right now. I can tell you whether there's a, a store in uh, Corpus Christi that might be out of uh, operation because the pipe broke. So live connection, sort of the ultimate way that a uh, private sector status can be shared out to everybody else is live, continuous, no human intervention. Third way is the number three there is the mobile app Spot on Response has created a relationship with Sabre and offers to the private sector the ability and the public sector the ability to have this downloadable app uh, that you subscribe to that can be given out to all the store managers who can report in their store status or uh, at the state level a state business emergency operations center can subscribe uh, very inexpensively to Spot on Response and be able to uh, then give it out to all of their companies and they can provide the information directly into Exchange Core that then goes back to the state through any of a number of different uh, ways that it operate uh, and software that are operating. That's Saber. How it gets used in this Cascadia exercise, I'm going to turn over to Mary Marsh. Here are a couple of examples of uh, Idaho information. Uh, you see Google Earth there. Uh, you see uh, web, no, uh, ArcGIS Online on the left side, the Spot on Response mobile app on the right side. And uh, Mary focused on Google Earth because it was uh, easy and available. 
And with that, uh, how about if I just turn it over to Mary to tell us about her experience. Uh, welcome, Mary. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as you said, it was very quick for us to uh, use Saber for just some information during our exercise. So the way Idaho played is we really didn't receive a lot of damage, but we were receiving 140,000 evacuees. So um, along with private sector partnerships, I also do mass care. So it was quite interesting for me and very valuable information for us to use SABER to be, uh, get the statuses not only in Idaho, but in Oregon and Washington since people were on their way to Idaho to uh, be sheltered. So uh, as Jim said, it was very easy and very quick. We were, I think we were both out of town, and I kind of hit him with, gee, it would be really cool if we could do SABER during this exercise. And I think it was like a week before, so I appreciate that, Jim. And uh, he sent me a instruction handbook, and I followed the instructions, and uh, followed the links. And it was really very simple. Uh, I'm definitely not an IT person, and I didn't have to even call one of ours to get it up, so it worked very nicely. After I got Google Earth all set and I got a saber on there, Jim sent me the links of the companies that were playing. So we were able to just uh, get those in Google Earth, and we had this really cool map that he's showing on the slide, which I um, was able to put on a display in our emergency operations center. And it's interesting because private sector partnerships is fairly new here in Idaho, and it really brought to light what we're doing, some of the, you know, some of the um, cool ways that we can work with the private sector and just get information. So that was really nice to have that on the monitor and be displayed to the whole exercise. Uh, it was, like I said, very simple. It really worked for our local jurisdictions, too, because I, you know, I'm always kind of helping them to work with the private sector folks. And I think it showed them how important it would be. Uh, North Idaho plays. So the folks in Coeur d'Alene, you were talking about sheltering and saw that, you know, the Walmarts up there were closed and they had some damage and it kind of changed their whole scenario, which, you know, in real life would happen. So it was, it was quite uh, valuable for us. And I think it really helped me, Jim, to get the word out on how important it is to start thinking about working with the private sector a little more. And uh, that was part of my plan and it was successful, so I really appreciated that. In the future, I'm hoping, we use WOC pretty heavily here in Idaho, so I'm hoping we move to the next step and get that integrated into our WOC so that we can have information going both ways. But um, like I said, like Jim said, this is just real quick and I was able to get it up and just show how we can monitor the private sector when we have an incident. So all in all, I think it was very successful. Appreciate those comments and we'll look forward to moving on with you. Thanks, Mary. At this point, let us move directly on to Ann Rosinski. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you. For California, um, we are using this Cascadia exercise as a build-up exercise to a more formal uh, exercise, the Vigilant Guard exercise in November of this year that the California National Guard is conducting. And the similarity that the Vigilant Guard exercise in the fall is going to be a multiple you know, simultaneous response to earthquakes in southern Nevada and a day later an earthquake in California. So it's a multi-state response effort. And that's the connection. That's the parallel with the Cascadia scenario. They're different earthquakes, but it's the idea that it's a multi-state response effort. And I want to thank everybody first before I get played off. This is like my Academy Award thank you speech. But all of these people, everything I'm going to be showing you is the work of all of these people and many more. And I can never thank them enough for all of their continued hard work and support because the clearinghouse just doesn't exist without them. The clearinghouse, when there's a major earthquake, the clearinghouse function is to provide information about the damaging impacts of the earthquake to emergency responders and others. So our founding managing 
clearinghouse partners are primarily scientists and engineers and researchers. And the clearinghouse has been around since 1971. And we've, so we've responded to numerous earthquakes and tsunamis that have affected California. And we facilitate field visits and collecting perishable data. We uh, provide a forum for sharing information. And that's the, the, the information muted part of what we do. And so that's what I'm going to focus on the rest of this, is the information sharing that we're, how we're using Exchange Core and some of these other tools to support that function of the clearinghouse. For South Napa earthquake, just to give you a little bit of an overview of the types of things that we do. So we do, in addition, you know, the information sharing is a part of, um, of these other efforts. So collecting field data, conducting overflights, we look at uh, remote sensing imagery, we conduct nightly briefings, um, we have a virtual clearinghouse, and we always have uh, at least one physical clearinghouse. In a major event, we'd have more than one. So it's a, it's a big, complicated uh, uh, enterprise, and it is completely cooperative, and it's unfunded. <laughs> so it's a, it's a mandate. It's part of the state law, but we, we don't have any funding. So that's one of the reasons we also like Exchange Core is because it fits our budget. It's open source. Again, the reason for doing this exercise is it's a multi-state, multi-region. Um, California is vulnerable to a lot of different earthquakes, but this one is going to affect the entire West Coast. And you can see, this is that same shake map Jim was showing, the Cascadia subduction zone runs actually from Cape Mendocino in California all the way north up into um, British Columbia. And the, you can see this is the shaking map. The shaking is going to expand is expected to be felt all the way down to the Bay Area and potentially could damage levees and cause uh, damage to our water systems here in California. And then the tsunami inundation itself, uh, the shaking, you know, if this is the uh, epicenter here, within three hours, the entire, you know, all the way down to Baja is going to be facing inundation as well. So even though this, um, it was a FEMA Region 9 exercise. We had plenty of reasons to be practicing for this event. So that's the background. So what I'm going to do is just take you through some of the data uh, that we collected, some of the workflows and things that um, we practiced with in the exercise. And uh, it's going to be a little bit rough because, as I said, this is a build-up exercise. We wanted to test some things out. And this is going to help us develop our exercise play for the more formal events later this fall. So I'm going to start with, from pan way out, just a, a global view. And so you can see we, we had information all the way up and down the West Coast. Um, we had information from the Portland and Washington areas. And one of the goals for the Clearinghouse was to be coordinating with the surrounding states and the, and the other affected states as well in terms of mutual aid and in, you know, in terms of main federal resources. In a, Southern San Andreas type of earthquake in the Bay Area or Southern California, assuming there's no other disasters anywhere else in the US, all the resources would come to California. But that's just not true for this earthquake. So it's important for us to be able to see information and be able to coordinate with other states. So zoom in a little bit. And you can see we start to get more resolution. And uh, the, you can start to see individual uh, it, items of interest. So we've got a, this is a National Guard Day 1 briefing. We've got uh, some uh, damage and release and environmental issue up here. Um, so uh, Eureka High School with some damage. What else do we have? Uh, the USGS shake map. So um, those are that uh, have been reported in. But want to provide a little bit of context to that. So um, we have had a lot of, we, a lot of GIS layers and other type of information that can help provide even more context and situational awareness. So I'm going to turn on a few of those. So we've got our USGS intensity overlay. Um, we've got a CGS geologic, actually, geologic compilation map. I'm going to turn on. Uh, and how about our quaternary fault map? Let's start with those. So now we've got a little bit more context. So. Um, logic issues. So now we can see those incidents in terms of the actual ground shaking. And we can see some of the fault information. Let's see here. There we go. So these are some of the faults in the area that potentially could have been um, impacted 
Uh, we might, might see some slip on some of those faults as a result of the uh, Cascadia event and the aftershock. So for the geologists and scientists heading out in this field, that's a fact. And let's see about that a little bit more information. We are encouraging different organizations to provide information that would help others understand you know, the earthquake impacts. And my organization, the California Geological Survey, of course, we do the geologic mapping and hazard mapping. And so we thought, well, it would be useful to have a regional geologic map for the area. We were able to bring in the geologic map. And it did carry some information with it, but we need to do a better job of figuring out what information we want to share. The shape, length, area, that's not particularly useful. But knowing what the, that this is Cretaceous Franciscan formation, that is important to geologists. So um, there's some useful information there, but we need to improve that a little bit. I also I do want to turn on some other information. So information about uh, Eureka Public Schools and what's happening on the local level. So this is information. So now we're starting to really put a picture together uh, from different sources. So um, these uh, pins here are information on California public schools. And that came from you know, my uh, ArcGIS online map. Phil Balin with City of Walnut Creek is uh, also with uh, the Northern California NAPSIG. Uh, he and Svetlana, our partners, um, are the co-chairs of the Northern California NAPSIG group. And they've been very proactive and very helpful in um, thinking about how to prepare for disasters. And so they spent a lot of time thinking about what kind of information would be useful. And they pre-staged a lot of different data layers ahead of time, and, and including these California public schools. And you can see there's thousands of them. And this isn't even all of them. This is just the public schools. It's not all the schools in California. And the Cascadia scenario is, you know, from my, from my primarily going to affect the coastline in Northern California. So we don't need all of those schools. To have all those just kind of obscures what we know. So what I did is I opened my, took that same map and I opened it in our, with the, our Exchange Core connector. And here's the connector here. And what I did is I took this subset of schools in the Eureka area and in the Humboldt area, and then I did another one up here in Crest, selected those, and I made separate layers, and I shared those out. And so that's what you now see, is instead of seeing all schools, you're just seeing that subset of public schools that's relevant to this disaster. And it's I can see it in spot on response, and then you can also share that information out through. It's in our Exchange Core, and so that would be um, also um, available in Google Earth, although not to this extent. Google Earth has a lot of limitations on what it can show. But at least you would be able, you would know that, OK, there's a subset of schools. And we can show that as well. But anyway, so um, this is providing a little bit more context. And now you can see, um, so these, these are plume models. These are uh, chlorine plumes that were developed by um, a number of different organizations. We worked with um, Humboldt County Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the California Department of Public Health, or excuse me, yes, California Department of Public Health and the California Environmental Protection Agency, as well as the National Guard. Bill Balin spearheaded this. Um, one of the objectives for this exercise was recognizing that having the ability to share information means that all these different organizations who have a role, who have a responsibility to respond to uh, environmental impacts about a disaster, one of the things that they, they commonly do is they create plume models. But they all look different. They're using different software. They're making different assumptions. For all of these responders participating in this event, they need to know what everybody else's perspective is. So being able to see the different plume models in context and seeing where they're similar and where they're different can be really important to how they respond. And then also, it's important to see, well, OK, now not only do we have these chemical plumes, but we've got you know, public schools in the way. So we've got, you know, and I happen to be standing right in the middle of it. So there, you know, this is a really good example of how being able to see information from different sources can help everybody have a better understanding of what the impacts are. And of course, seeing the shaking, um, then they also know, you know what the potential for damage is at these structures. and. Um, the clearinghouse can make sure that we uh, are warning 
are clearinghouse volunteers to stay away from those areas and warn them if they've been exposed to seek immediate medical attention. So this is a really nice example of uh, bringing that data in from different sources. Bay area, there I am. And so we've got some other incidents down here. We have, um, here is a levy failure. And if I click on this one, you can see we've got some, uh, we've got a number of observations that were, we've got um, some, and we've got some photos. If I click on that, you can see that levy photo. And in back again, back over to ArcGIS online map, as I added the California um, Earthquake Clearinghouse Exchange Core feed to my ArcGIS online map, and then all these incidents here are the exact same incidents that we see on the spot on map over here. Is that levy break? Exact same photo. So that are using ArcGIS online, they can see that same information. I did the same thing. I took our Clearinghouse Exchange Core GRSS feed and I added it to my Google Earth, and I can see that same information. Um, with limited, you know, again, the Google Earth has slightly more limited. It's a viewer. We can't share information and create instances and share them out. Something else I did with our ArcGIS Online, so I added the GeoRSS feed, but then I was also able to symbolize those. So I had a specific for the clearinghouse. Um, let's turn this off. You can see this is the uh, clearinghouse exchange core feed for just the incidents. And then I also had one, a feed for all of the observations associated with those incidents. And then I also decided, well, you know, if I'm only, if, if you know, somebody's just interested in tsunami incidents, I created a special feed where I took the incident feed and then there, you can modify that and bring in just specific types of incidents. So that's what I did is this is also a feed I brought in only the tsunami incident. So if somebody's just interested in seeing that, they can see that as well and they and can re-symbolize. So it's a nice way for uh, to be able to pull information in from Exchange Core and then um, again using the connector, being able to select information, we can push information through the connector out to um, our other. All of these incidents um, that we saw in Spot On, if they had a photo or if they had some GIS information, and you can see that as well. So that was a really nice way. And for us, that's important because the, um, as I mentioned, the clearinghouse is entirely cooperative. We cannot um, and do not dictate or imp imp tell any of our partners how to do their job or what tools they should use. And some of them um, don't have ArcGIS online. It's, you know, it's a really great, it's not free. And that imposes some um, hurdles for certain uh, some of our partners. So Google Earth is a really nice way for people to be able to see it, and including um, the California National Guard. They can view our clearinghouse incident data in in their Google Earth in their jock. So this is a really nice tool for us. I do want to go back, and I want to show something. I'll give uh, Maggie Glasgow a little bit of an intro. So one of the things you know, the NASA teams that have asked for a good five years now and working with us developing some really important uh, damage and loss estimation and remote sensing and a whole array of um, different tools. So these are different uh, uh, damage or observations and incidents that people have uh, reported in on as a result of the earthquake and tsunami. And we have shown how the layer information that's been provided from different organizations like California Geological Survey, USGS, the different state agencies can provide more context to those incidents so we can make more informed decisions. And I should point out that the NASA teams, all the data and information that you see for the clearinghouse, these are all capabilities, can provide for uh, other states as well. So this is just what they, all these products and services are available for types of tools we did for the earthquake. You'll see these red, yellow, and green dots that now show up on the map, and these are what they did is they took the hazardous uh, information and they added to that the USGS shake map, shaking intensity information, and they provided this output that pretty much instantaneously that shows where there's a potential for damage to different types of infrastructure. And I think there's, I forget how many, I think there's 18 or 19 different layers. This is just the 
specific um, transportation layer for Northern California. And again, we're, they did this in such a way that they're not providing information about the entire state because we don't need to see all of that. And we only need to see the ones that are potentially damaged or in the area of interest. So I'm going to zoom in. And you see there's this one red dot here. And it happens to be on Highway 101. And you'll notice, too, the, the locations are a little bit off. And that's because the hazardous data is deliberately uh, obfuscated a little bit. So it's not an error on the NASA team's part. That's, but for the purposes of what we're doing, this is good enough. So a clearinghouse volunteer, when the earthquake happens, it's going to take us a while to get everything up and running for the clearinghouse. Um, we are not a first responder organization. We're not an emergency responder organization. So we need to wait our turn for our resources. It's much more important for the you know, life safety missions and things like that to be addressed first. So, but the clearinghouse will be operating. We're using you know, Exchange Core and our mobile capabilities and using technology to support our virtual clearinghouse operations. So even though um, we may not have a physical location, in this area, our clearinghouse volunteers that are ready, willing, and able can already still go out and be collecting information right away. And we want to make sure that we're not having to wait for the physical clearinghouse operations to catch up to what's happening in the field in real time. So this tool, one thing that's really nice about it is our clearinghouse volunteers can use it to self-deploy. So as a someone heading up Highway 101 from the Bay Area, they see that, OK, there are some areas where there's potential for damage. And you can click on, click on the NASA information. And it gives you, you know, basic you know, latitude, longitude, what is it, uh, and whether it's color coded. And Maggie can talk a little bit about how this is all done. But then the, as a clearinghouse volunteer, I can go up to that area. And then I can file a, you know, a report on it. So here's the, uh, I can say, OK, well, now I can ground truth it. This is, there's a model prediction of damage at this location. And I'm here, and now I can show you exactly you know, what, what I see. And I can report back, and there's damage to the Eagle Prairie Bridge, and I can provide a photo. And again, my Google Earth is a little slow. But I can, what's great about this is there's a lot of really good tools and models out there, but one of the goals of the clearinghouse is to bridge that gap between model predictions. Um, and this is in response to a comment I heard a couple of years ago from a FEMA colleague who was saying they've had to send people out on the street with walkie-talkies and just say, tell me what you see. So one of the things the NASA team is doing is um, they're going to be improving this tool so that we would be able to actually update, you know, click on that point and provide information, this kind of you know, real-time in observations and update the infrastructure database on the fly so that we're, we're closing that gap between, you know, those model predictions and real-world conditions, which is really, really critically important for, you know, being able to respond and, and find out what's going on. So. Um, that's just a brief tour. I'm going to wrap things up because I want to give Maggie a chance to talk. But what we did, so again, this exercise was a build-up exercise. So we learned a lot. Um, so we, there are some things that we need to practice. So um, as I showed, things like formatting. You know, We had some successes in sharing out different types of data. But we need to improve how we do that, making sure that we're sharing out the right metadata and that we, when it displays, that it has um, you know, it's, it's not too opaque. So thinking about those sorts of things. Um, also, we, uh, user error. I would, we, the Spot On team provided a capability for us to directly upload. And they'll host our KMZ files. But operator error on my part, I used the wrong naming convention. So I was adding spaces to the name. And so they weren't loading. So we, we figured it out. And we were able to. To get, but those are you know those are the types of things that we are going to be developing for the next exercise. And there's also some other t tools and other capabilities that we were beta testing that I'm not going to show because they're um, they say they're beta version. But tune in in November, um, a heat map showing areas where field investigators have visited. So helping us do some analytics on the information that's coming in again in real time to help our volunteers self-deploy and uh, direct their expertise more effectively during the event. 
Um, also, one of the most important lessons we learned is these tools that I'm showing, they're all available all the time. They're not just available for the disaster. They're not just available for uh, an exercise. And we need to be practicing and using these things daily or you know, in our daily operations because security settings change. Our technology support, they make changes to things and we don't find out about it until there's an earthquake and then we, well, how come I can't, how come I can't get through this firewall all of a sudden? Oh, well, there were six security updates since the last time I tried it. Those are things that, um, you know, all of these tools, whether it's ArcGIS Online or Spot On or Exchange Core, they can all get around those things, but they're, they're not mind readers. You know, these are things that we have to make sure that we, you know, just a part of daily life when, with technology these days is, um, and we don't want to find those things out when we're pressed for time, when we're trying to respond to a disaster. So that's something else that's a really big lesson that we learned. Um, so with that, like I say, I apologize, it's a little bit rough, but just wanted to show you some of the things that we're working on and encourage all of you to tune in for the exercise, the Vigilant Guard exercise, and participate with the Clearinghouse over the next several months. We'll be doing some training and planning, and we'd love to have uh, our other partners participate. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Maggie. So a couple of slides here from um, a briefing that we did for the Clearinghouse just to talk about some of the NASA data products that uh, we shared with the Clearinghouse for the companion exercise. Um, so we have uh, five teams that um, participate with the Clearinghouse, um, uh, uh, and we've been teaming with them for the past so five years, as Anne mentioned. So we have uh, my, my project, eDecider. Um, and the, our, our sister project, GeoGateway. And then uh, the UAV SAR team supported the exercise, READY, and ARIA. Um, so the NASA uh, teams provide satellite and airborne-based uh, deformation and damage assessment products um, and deformation modeling products, as well as the damage and loss estimation modeling pro uh, products that Anne uh, featured, as well as the, some aftershock likelihood maps. And uh, the READY team produces these rapid GPS-based earthquake and tsunami um, modeling information um, for the earthquake and tsunami disaster response. Um, and we also had um, uh, the various NASA teams um, that provided some spontaneous injects for the main Cascadia um, exercise. And so we delivered these products to the clearinghouse and partners through Exchange Corps. And Anne showed um, a number of these products um, to you, and I'm just going to show you a couple of um, other ones um, here um, through Spot On Response, if I can find the, right, here we are. Um, so um, I'm located up here in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm, I'm up in Seattle, um, and I'm going to show you some of the, the information um, up in the Pacific Northwest. As Anne, um, as Anne mentioned, we, uh, we provided um, information information um, all along uh, the West Coast. So she showed you some of the, the information that we provided in California, and um, I'm going to show you some of the multi-state information that we provided. So um, here displayed on the screen is the aftershock likelihood um, layer, and on top of it I've um, shown the 20-mile radius trans transportation um, and, and Seattle. And you can see here that the, the um, benefit of having um, this multi-layer uh, uh, display is that you can um, have uh, the the information um, where you can you can see um, the potential for um, the damage on top of where you might have um, other um, damage. So the aftershock likelihood forecast shows you where you might have um, other damaging earthquakes and you have this uh, the layers where you show where the um, the damage has uh, likely occurred already. So as Anne described, if you're out in the field and you self-deployed and you're already investigating and you have this other layer, um, this kind of where other damage might occur um, and you've already been investigating where the damage has already possibly occurred. Two layers that eDecider has provided, and I can show you some of the other um, products. So here is a listing of um, some of the other NASA products here. Um, these are incidents um, that we've provided in, um, in the area of, uh, around um, the Seattle. Let's zoom out here and 
They're all uh, reported um, with respect to the epicenter, so that's why um, when I zoomed in um, with my location near Seattle, they're all, um, all of these layers are showing up uh, near the epicenter. Um, we, we put our geo bookmark um, near Seattle. So um, you can see here that um, we've got the ready um, rapid GPS products. We've got the aftershock forecast products, um, the the e decider critical uh, critical infrastructure damage and loss of, um, estimation products. And so we provided both um, critical infrastructure and just the critical infrastructure uh, information in a radius uh, um, of interest. And then we did this damage and loss estimation. And so this is based on the Hazus MH. Um, it, advanced engineering building module um, protocol, and then um, various other teams provided some other um, uh, uh, information. So we have uh, the JPL tsunami team provided some tsunami, tsunami models and our ionosphere natural hazards team um, provided some tsunami information. Um, the UAV star radar products are actually located um, further down in the Bay Area. and. Then um, the ARIA team provided some radar-based damage assessment products. So I'll go ahead and, and show you some of these other layers. So um, as Ann showed you, you can go in and guess layers here, and we, we have a number of them. So I'm going to um, turn off the aftershock layer and show you some of the radar. Um, information is very handy because you can see some of the other information that can provide you with um, some assessment of just so if I can find the ARIA information here. So uh, one of the um, nice uh, pieces of information that ARIA um, provides is they have this damage proxy map. And this is a radar-based um, assessment of where uh, damage um, has occurred. And so, so one of the nice things is that they can use the radar to, um, like I said, do some um, survey and do um, these red pixels um, do a quick, quick assessment of where the possible building damage is. So this is a tsunami damage proxy map. So they can use the radar to do an assessment of where the um, possible tsunami, and they can, um, depending on when the radar is acquired, um, they can use that and process that quickly and do a damage assessment. So these are um, some of the um, products that um, NASA was able to provide. Um, so I know that we're getting tight on time here, so I just wanted to, to do kind of a quick overview of some of the, some of the products. And I know Ann showed some of our other ones. So um, I, I'll just go ahead and wrap up here just to take some questions, Jim. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Maggie. appreciate sure. that uh, quick tour through the, the NASA uh, things and uh, there are, you know, Maggie has websites that uh, where you can see this this further and uh, by contacting. Oh yeah, I can bring up that slide. By contacting uh, um, by contacting Anne, you can actually get access to the archive of the data uh, that the Clearinghouse has uh, created. So you can get in there and poke around yourself. So I'll I'll make that offer for Anne that. Uh, if any of you want to sign up with the Clearinghouse, you'd be eligible to be able to go in and uh, play with this data uh, using spot-on response as well. So at this point, let me open it up to, to questions. Okay, so this is Phil Malin, a GIS coordinator in uh, Walnut Creek. And as mentioned, we staged a lot of data. One of our major learning uh, goals was to see how it worked within the various softwares. And now that we can share data through Exchange Core, it behooves us to work with uh, combined data sets and figure out how our decision makers are going to sift apart and understand how to make decisions from all this data. So it's just a point that we've got to a step now where we can sources of information about sometimes the same bridge or road but we still need to develop workflow processes to end up with a uh, authoritative decision on whether roads or bridges are open. But this opens the door for us to do this. Great, excellent content, comment, uh, Phil. Let me let me thank all of our our presenters. Uh, 
Mary Marsh from Idaho, Ann Rosinski from the California Earthquake Clearinghouse, Maggie Glasgow, Dr. Maggie Glasgow from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Really great insight into all the things that were done over the uh, three days last week, and I appreciate it very much.